Good afternoon. And to those of you in an earlier time zone, good morning. And to some of you, good evening. And welcome to the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging Annual Patient Education Day. My name is Stephen Schwartz. I represent the Lymphoma Research Foundation as a non-Hodgkin lymphoma survivor, and I'm the immediate past chair of the Society's Patient Advocacy Advisory Board. We are pleased to be here with you, and thank you for joining us. This is the ninth year SNMMI has held this event, and it's the first time it's been done virtually. And I'm sure you've heard that many other times when you've gone online. We're excited about the opportunity to share the latest advances in nuclear medicine in this format, which allows us to reach a broader audience. We have registrations from across North America and even from Brazil, Germany, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, and South Africa. Today's event is put together by this SNMMI's Patient Advocacy Advisory Board, which represents 14 different advocacy groups, including prostate cancer advocacy organizations, Men's Health Network, Us2 International, Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness, and Zero Cancer. Most of the patient advocacy board members are out there watching the webinar today, and we wanna thank each of them for your help in putting together an excellent program lineup of speakers and all you do throughout the year. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors. We couldn't hold the programming without their generous support. You'll find them listed on the website and we'll see that many of them are provided patient materials on that site. And I would encourage you to please go there and visit. Our sponsors, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Estellas Pharma, Blue Earth Diagnostics, ITM, Jubilant Radio Pharma, Progenics Pharmaceuticals. Please note that we will have time to address questions after the sessions. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do so using the Slido feature we have set up. All questions will be asked anonymously from your phone, your tablet, or your computer. You should see a Q&A box on your screen, which you can use to submit questions at any time. Also, Please be aware that this event is being recorded and SNMMI plans to place it on the website very shortly. And one last bit of housekeeping because I know we have to do some, we have some physicians and technologists joining us this morning. We're pleased to welcome you and appreciate all that you do. But note, there is no continuing education credit being offered for these Patient Education Day webinars. So let's get started. Our first speaker, Dr. John Sunderland from the University of Iowa. Dr. Sunderland serves as director of the university's Pet Imaging Center as an associate professor of radiology, an associate professor of radiation oncology, and an associate professor of physics and astronomy. He is also the vice chair of SNMMI's clinical trials network. He's going to share an overview of nuclear medicine, molecular imaging, and radiation safety. Please help me Welcome, Dr. Sunderland. Greetings from the, from the heartland. Um, I'm John Sunderland. I'm the director of the Pet Imaging Center at the University of Iowa. Uh, and I'm here, I think, to open the Patient Education Day talk with an overview, a broad overview of uh, nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. Now, in general, uh, we're just going to be covering uh, a few topics um, from a 40,000 foot view. We're going to start with just a single slide to differentiate anatomic imaging, which you're more familiar with, than from, from nuclear medicine molecular imaging. Uh, then we're going to go on to, since I'm a physicist by training, to go into nuclear medicine and how it works from kind of a, a chemistry and physics standpoint at a very basic level. Uh, and then I have about 15 case studies, all different nuclear medicine molecular imaging procedures, which I'm going to go through just kind of one at a time to give a broad overview of the kind of studies that we do. Uh, and I'll finish up with uh, radiation safety considerations, because after all, we are dealing with, uh, uh, with radiation here. And, uh, and then finally, we're going to finish with just a single slide on, on COVID-19 and kind of its impact on, on imaging and, uh, and healthcare. So starting right off just with this single slide, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you see the standard anatomic imaging, which you guys are probably more familiar with, MRI, which frankly uses the, uh, the, the magnetic properties of, of protons of hydrogen nuclei to create 
uh, exquisite anatomical uh, images of the human body. Um, you can see angiography, ultrasound, which gives you real time, you know, being able to look at, at, at fetuses uh, in, in, inside, inside the womb, uh, and actually sitting uh, over to the, to in, in the bottom corner is the most diagnostic CT I've seen in a long time, where you can see uh, the, the, the CT lung of, of lung cancer. You can see that the arrows pointing to where the lung cancer is. You can see that texture where the emphysema is manifesting, and of course, to finish the diagnosis, there's the cigarette sitting up here in the short pocket. Uh, but all of these are anatomic imaging as opposed to the nuclear medicine molecular imaging that we're talking about. So what we see here on the right-hand side of the screen uh, is, uh, is a PET scan, positron emission tomography of glucose metabolism. You can see the heart utilizing glucose, you can see the brain utilizing glucose, but most importantly, you can see the tumor, which is rapidly dividing energy, uh, energy requiring cells that are growing, uh, and so they use a lot of glucose so we can see it and diagnose it very clearly. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, we can see dopamine storage. Dopamine storage uh, helps us diagnose motion disorders, and in particular, Parkinson's disease and differentiating it from others so we know how to treat it. In the bottom right, you can see perfusion imaging of the heart. That's what parts of the heart are actually getting blood. Um, here on the right-hand side, you can see the resting, uh, but under stress and exercise conditions, part of the heart is not getting enough blood. If you were to just image the heart anatomically, it would look just fine. It would maybe be beating just fine, but the patient would be experiencing pain, angina, uh, due to the fact that you're not getting enough blood there. So we're imaging function in biochemistry as opposed to anatomy, and it gives us a whole different, uh, different outlook. If you think back to your, uh, your, your chemistry uh, in high school, you remember the intro being introduced to the periodic table, all of the elements that make up the world and, and make up you. Uh, what we're going to look at in particular is just one of these elements. We're going to look at, at carbon. This is really, the periodic table is a, is a two-dimensional uh, representation of really what's a three-dimensional space. So carbon, most of the carbon in your body is carbon-12. Um, carbon, it's carbon-12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. A small percentage of the carbon in your body is actually carbon-13, where you have six protons and seven neutrons. Uh, and that's fine and that's stable. But if we stuff an extra neutron into the nucleus, the nucleus becomes unbalanced and unstable. And it ends up stable nuclei have to become stable, and they do that by radioactive decay. That's what radioactive decay does. Unstable nuclei have to become stable, and so they do that. So, so carbon-14 decays by beta decay, um, and it has a long half-life of on the order of, uh, of about 6,000 years. But we can go the other way, right? We can actually go to carbon-11, where we have six protons and five neutrons. This is more unstable. It has a half-life of only 20 minutes. Because it has too many protons, it doesn't decay by beta decay. It decays by positron decay, positron emission. And what we do in the nuclear medicine biz is we'll take uh, this carbon-11, which is a positron emitter, and we will do some chemistry pretty quick, the half-life, and we'll make a, a molecule like this, which is C11 labeled choline, which allows us to, uh, to image prostate cancer and find metastases from prostate cancer, which you can see uh, over here on the, on, on the right side uh, of, of, of the image here. Uh, it's, a, it's a metastatic lymph node, same size. Anatomically, it looks normal, but it had, it's where the disease is. Uh, just for completeness, there are three kinds of, uh, of radioactive decay. It's not that complicated. We have beta decay. Beta decay is where an electron is emitted from the nucleus. What really happens is a neutron turned by losing the, the, the negative charge to an electron. This electron only goes about a millimeter, um, and that's largely inconsequential. What is consequential is emission of this beta particle. The, uh, the, the nucleus is in an excited state, and it gives off a gamma ray. And gamma rays can blast right on through the human body to the detectors in our scanner. So what we're detecting is the gamma that comes from the relaxing nucleus, not the, uh, the beta particle. This is what happens if we have too many neutrons in the nucleus. If we have too many protons in the nucleus, it decays by positron decay. Positron decay is actually kind of cool. What ends up happening is a proton turns into a neutron, and it does this by emitting a positron. A positron is an antimatter electron. Yes, there is such a thing as antimatter. It, too, travels only about a millimeter or so, and after that, it runs into an electron, its matter counterpart. This is matter and antimatter. And what ends up happening is when matter meets antimatter, they annihilate, they disappear. Uh, that whole matter can neither be created nor destroyed. No, that's, that's not right. Um, the, the positron has mass, the electron has mass. When all is done, the mass is gone. 
What you get in its place, however, is two gamma rays that are going off in exactly opposite directions. And these are highly penetrating. They go through the body and our scanners can detect them. Uh, alpha decay, we'll, we'll talk about very briefly when we talk about therapeutic applications. Um, just important to, to understand it's the gamma rays that penetrate through the, penetrate through the tissue and uh, allows, allow us to image. So why is it called nuclear medicine? It's because our signal is coming from the nucleus. Um, when we do, uh, when we do a, a study, a nuclear medicine study, molecular imaging study, we always take a radioactive atom. It could be carbon, it could be fluorine, it could be iron. We attach it to a molecule whose physiology we want to trace. This is a glucose molecule to which we attach a fluorine 18. And we inject a tiny quantity of this into your body. When I say tiny, I mean tiny. We're injecting on a typical study on the order of a millionth of a single grain of sugar. There's going to be no side effects or anything from that amount of, of, of really anything uh, in, in the body. And then we use special scanners to detect the gamma rays that are emitted from the, this radioactive isotope, which, uh, which is excited and, and it needs to, needs to decay on down. So nuclear medicine, because the signal is coming from, uh, coming from the nucleus. Important to understand that with gamma rays, uh, gamma rays are just the same as x-rays. It's just they come from the nucleus, not from the electrons of the atom. So there's no real difference. It's just electromagnetic radiation in, in either case. In the end, what's really important with nuclear medicine and molecular imaging is the radiopharmaceuticals. The scanners are great. The scanners are getting better. But what allows us to image different diseases is the different radiopharmaceuticals. So here's three examples. We have the sugar on the left, the radioactive sugar, which allows us to uh, image cancer. We can image brain metabolism. We can actually even image cardiac metabolism. In the middle, we can image Alzheimer's disease by imaging uh, the amyloid plaques that deposit in the brain. This particular molecule binds to the amyloid proteins in the brain. Or on the right, uh, we have gallium-68 dotatoc, uh, which binds specifically to neuroendocrine tumors because this molecule down here binds to somatostatin receptors, and we can, uh, we can image disease. So in the end, it's really all about the radiopharmaceuticals. That's what our scientists are, are working hard on, is very specific, disease-specific uh, radiopharmaceuticals. In the end, if the, the, the radionuclide, which is attached to the molecule, is a positron emitter, we use a PET scanner. If it decays by negative beta decay and then emits a single gamma, then we use a SPECT scanner. It's as simple, uh, it's as, simple as that. What's the process? The process is simple. The first thing we do is to uh, administer the radiopharmaceutical. Probably 99% of the time, we inject it intravenously, usually into an arm. Um, what I have here and what I want you to see is what happens to the radiopharmaceutical once we inject it. This, is, this one's not injected in the arm. Uh, it's actually injected in the leg, but you can see as time passes, one second, two seconds, four or five, it's going up the vein uh, in, in, in the leg, it's going to the heart, it's going to the lungs, it's going to the rest of the body. Uh, you know, one minute in, you can actually start seeing it being metabolized uh, in different parts of the body and in the heart. Or a couple minutes in, gradually you'll see the metabolism going into the brain. Uh, so this is a PET scan, which is allowing us to, uh, to, to view this. Uh, in general, our, our PET scans are static. Uh, but this is just showing you the, the process. The imaging uh, itself usually takes 15 to 30 minutes. SPECT scans typically take a little bit longer, but it's mostly inject. We wait for the radiopharmaceutical to go where it's going to go. That depends on the pharmaceutical, how long we wait. And then we image it. Uh, and it really is as simple as that. And then you, then you go home. Uh, in PET, uh, what we're doing is we're imaging those two gamma rays that are going off in opposite directions. The patient is surrounded, although they don't see them, with tens of thousands of little tiny radiation detectors. Uh, when one detector detects an event, he kind of raises his hand and says, I got one. And if another one gets an event, detects an event at the same time, and the same time defined in PET scanner is five billionths of a second, so there's really accurate clocks going on, uh, then that's simultaneous. And because these are going off in opposite directions, we know the event happened between these and we can localize where it occurs. We don't just detect one of them. We end up detecting on the order of tens of millions of these events during that 15 or 20 minute scan. And from that, we can create an image of the distribution and more importantly, the image of the disease. SPECT works functionally the same way, except we get one gamma ray at a time, not two. And so there's generally two heads here. It's usually not a ring, usually two heads. We can either detect it here or we can detect it here. And this ends up gradually rotating around the patient. And because it has to rotate uh, over the course, of, uh, the course of time, it takes a little bit longer than a PET scan usually. But it's literally as simple as that. 
So now what I want to do is to say, now that we know vaguely how it works, we're going to go into some applications. I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, on this first slide just so you understand because they all follow this basic uh, uh, basic structure. In the upper left, you'll see the chemical structure. It'll tell you whether it's a PET or SPECT uh, radiopharmaceutical. There'll be an example image. We'll discuss what it's used for, what its uses like staging of cancer, response to therapy, recurrence of cancer. I'll let you know about what the availability is, um, whether it's, av it's available everywhere or limited, whether it's approved by FDA or not, and what the reimbursement situation is. Sometimes I'll have a note over here, like for example, FDG is, it's used for a lot of cancers and really more than this, but it's not used for prostate cancer usually, and it's not used for neuroendocrine tumors because those are very slow growing and their glucose utilization isn't very high. Uh, and then kind of the scientific localization mechanism is here. So these will be present on all the slides. I'm not going to cover them all, but this is uh, this is the structure. So I mentioned that neuroendocrine tumors, FDG doesn't work very well for that glucose analog. Uh, so what we're using here is an FDA-approved agent called NetSpot. It's gallium-68 dotatate, and it binds very specifically to the somatostatin receptors uh, that are on neuroendocrine tumors. It's used for all kinds of... Uh, uh, uses in, in cancer for staging, response to therapy, uh, finding the primary tumor. Sometimes the, uh, we, we know where the metastases are, we don't know where the primary is, and you might want to go in and surgically take that out. Um, it's available in a lot of places around the United States, but gallium-68 only has a half-life of, of about one hour, and, as, and we don't make that much of it at a time, so we can't distribute it long distances, so it has to be, has to be local. Um, it is FDA approved and it is uh, well reimbursed, but you generally need to uh, get, get pre-approval. Um, this is a map uh, provided to me by Josh Mailman uh, of where you can get this done in the United States. So in most, uh, most of the populous areas, it's readily available, but there's a large chunk of the U.S. Uh, that would have to travel a pretty long distance to get one of these scans, which, are, which can be very important from a, a management standpoint. Uh, prostate cancer was another problem uh, that we were having because it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, to detect with the fluorodeoxyglucose. Um, about three years ago, FACBC was approved. This is the trade name Axumen. Um, it works by amino acid transport, so that's, in, in, that's increased in prostate cancer and, and in metastases. Here you can see you know, a small lymph node. Anatomically, it looks identical to a regular lymph node, but here it is. It's positive. It's where the, where the disease is, the reason the patient's PSA is rising. Uh, this is available just about everywhere. It is FDA approved, and generally it's uh, well reimbursed, but it takes some work up with, uh, with pre-approval. Uh, cardiac perfusion, I've mentioned this before. This is a bread and butter nuclear medicine scan. It can be done with PET, with a PET agent, Cardiogen. It can be done with SPECT by Technetium 99 Sestamibi. This is, uh, Sestamibi is, is much more uh, ubiquitously used with SPECT uh, than, 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 the, than the PET, uh, but both of them are available, both of them are approved, both of them are, are reimbursed. And we're looking at perfusion, blood flow to the heart. This is an interesting situation. This is Alzheimer's disease. Three companies have approved agents for imaging Alzheimer's disease uh, by these, these, these radiopharmaceuticals uh, that all bind to amyloid in the brain. Uh, the, and they're, they're available uh, in a lot of the major, uh, major cities in, in, in the U.S. The problem is they're not reimbursed by Medicare, by CMS. They don't, uh, they don't reimburse. Their, uh, their rationale is there's no treatment, so uh, why should we pay? Um, well, it is actually, there are a bunch of applications for this, there, but it is, there is a reimbursement issue. This just is, is, a, is a slide that shows uh, where, one of the places where it's pretty important. Um, on, on the left-hand side, NC stands for normal control. This is normal uptake of one of these amyloid agents. Uh, the middle two are the important ones. MCI stands for mild cognitive impairment. That means the patient is a little bit forgetful. Their cognition is a little bit lower than it uh, probably was in the past. These two have identical symptoms. You do one of these amyloid scans and you can see this patient doesn't have any amyloid. Their, their cognitive impairment is likely not due to Alzheimer's disease. It's likely due to something else that might be treatable. Um, here you have a patient, you can see there's a full load of, of amyloid, just as much as you see in a full-blown case of, of amyloid. So we can, we can differentiate uh, this based upon, once again, the biochemistry of the disease. Uh, a lung VQ scan is used very commonly for diagnosis of pul pul pulmonary embolism. 
the reason I brought this, I'm showing this one is because I mentioned that you know 99% of these drugs are injected. Um, this is one where, uh, with the ventilation, we actually inject a radioactive gas, xenon-133, to image so we can see what parts of what when air is getting into the lungs. We also look at where blood is getting into the lungs, and from the combination of these two, we can diagnose where a pulmonary embolism is. Uh, these are also FDA-approved routinely uh, and, and routinely uh, reimbursed. Uh, here we have Parkinson's disease. I showed you a slide of this in the very beginning, normal uptake in Parkinson's. Uh, that scan uh, is, uh, is what, we're, what we're seeing here. This has been around for a few years, uh, and it, it's quite good. I have this one in red here because FDA just recently approved F18 fluoridopa uh, for Parkinson's disease. That means it's kind of brand new within the, within the last year. Um, this is not available uh, ubiquitously right now and probably won't be uh, for the for the foreseeable future, um, but it is it is new and and we're uh, we're moving forward with such things. Uh, this is another exciting new one. Once again, it's in red because it's new. Just within the last couple of months, uh, fluoroestradiol F18 fluoroestradiol was approved by FDA. The trade name is Seriana. Um, it is uh, it is for estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. Um, turns out breast cancers come in in kind of different flavors, so to speak. Uh, if you if your if your uh, if your tumors if your metastases are estrogen receptor positive, that opens up a whole new branch of uh, of treatment options that a are very effective and b have have lower uh, lower side effects. Um, but you don't want to do that uh, unless you know that the patients have this particular estrogen positive uh, estrogen positive kind of uh, signature. And so with this now, we will be able to uh, better treat uh, the breast cancer patient population. This was just recently approved. The distribution network is not in place, uh, so it will not be commercially available uh, until probably the first of the year. But by that time, the national distribution network should be all, should be all set up. So this is an exciting new development. Um, just to let you know that things are not static, we have a few new approvals that are, that are in red. Here's a couple that are around the corner. Um, this is another uh, prostate cancer agent, uh, gallium-68 PSMA. It, is, uh, it has been demonstrated to be exceedingly sensitive uh, at finding even very small, uh, very small cancers. Um, so this is, a, this is a huge step forward. This is not approved by FDA, but the phase three clinical trials have been done by academic centers and UCLA and the University of California, San Francisco have submitted a new drug application to FDA. It is under review. And we hope, can we have our fingers crossed, that uh, sometime this fall we'll get some good news that this will be an approved agent. That doesn't necessarily mean it will be universally available, although it certainly will be available at those two centers. Um, and, and, and others may be able to follow suit uh, a, a little bit after. Which is why it's all the more important that this other agent, F18 uh, PYL, is another prostate cancer patient, that, uh, agent that has not uh, not yet been approved, uh, but it is a commercial uh, a commercial agent. There's an inte intellectual property here. The phase three trial is complete. They're writing their NDA now. Uh, hopefully within a year it will be submitted and within another year it will be approved. Obviously there's no guarantee about this, but what's nice about this is this will be distributable. We can make a lot more of this. They can distribute at longer distances. Uh, and this should be available that make it available to the general population of the of the United States, assuming it reaches approval. So this is uh, another exciting uh, exciting development um, for the country at large. Uh, and the last new agent uh, that's uh, that's that will be out there hopefully is copper sixty four dotatate. I mentioned gallium sixty eight dotatate, and I showed you the map of availability. Uh, it turns out there's a large portion of the country that doesn't have access because you can't get the gallium sixty eight there. Well, copper 64 has a half-life of, of uh, about 12 hours. And so in, they can make the copper 64 in, in the center of the country. They can make the, the copper 64 dotatate, and they can send it kind of functionally via FedEx anywhere in the country. So this should make the availability to the neuroendocrine tumor uh, uh, cancer population uh, a, a new agent, hopefully. And we might hear something as early as the third quarter of this year. So we have our fingers crossed on that. So moving to another uh, new and it's not really new, but functionally it's new, a new and
mix therapeutic applications of, of nuclear medicine. Uh, we're used to the idea of, of radiation, uh, radiation therapy, but it's mostly via external beam radiation therapy. We have these accelerators. You blast the tumor uh, from all sorts of direct, different directions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different directions, and where they all overlap, you can get, uh, you can get a, a lethal dose to the tumor while you get less dose to you know, the normal tissue on the outside. But wouldn't it be cool if we could get the radiation from inside the tumor and just kind of get it to, to irradiate and bake the tumor from the inside and spare all this outside tissue. This only makes sense because you know we're already getting these radiopharmaceuticals uh, to go directly to the tumors and almost nowhere else. So, uh, so why couldn't we do this? Well, with imaging, we try to inject as small an amount as we can to make sure we don't give an excess radiation dose to the patient. But what if we purposely gave them a lot well, the problem with gallium-68 is it has a short half-life. We could give them a lot, but it would decay away very quickly. Uh, what the game plan is right now is we inject the same dotatate, but not labeled with gallium-68, which has a half-life of an hour. We, we, we label it with lutetium-177. Mother Nature gave, her, gave us this one with a half-life of about a week. And so you inject it, it goes to the tumors, and it bombards the tumors with radiation for weeks. And then when it's decayed down, we give another dose. And when it decays down, we give another dose. And you can see, and we can image that lutetium. You can see here in B. And here you can see uh, a patient uh, who has received this lutetium dotatate therapy where they had a huge body burden of tumor uh, reduced to almost nothing. Now, they don't all work this way, but this shows the power of the methodology. In fact, this lutetium-177 dotatate was approved in January of 2018. Um, uh, on, on, the, on very strong evidence, you can see a progression-free survival of, of patients that were on Ludifera was way, way better than the next best treatment, the common treatment for this. Uh, and uh, because it's long-lived, you can get this pretty much almost, uh, almost anywhere. Uh, another one that's around the corner that we're looking at is, the is, is lutetium-177 PSMA. We had the gallium gallium-68 PSMA for imaging, but we can do the same therapeutic, uh, th uh, same kind of therapeutic thing. Here is a best case scenario. Here we have six, six patients, uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, here we see in red the tumor burden before, tumor burden after. Tumor burden before, tumor burden after. And C, tumor burden before, after. Some potential remarkable successes here. Um, this phase three trial has been completed and they're working on the, on the new drug application. Probably will be uh, a year or two before they submit that. But soon, uh, hopefully, we will have, soon, meaning within a few years, with our fingers crossed, we might have an approved therapeutic agent uh, for widespread metastatic, metastatic uh, prostate cancer. It's very exciting. And just to, to let you know that, you know, it's not all roses. Sometimes here's a patient with widespread metastatic, metastatic disease, uh, and they've had this lutetium-177 PSMA done in a clinical trial, and lo and behold, not only did it not get better, it continued to get worse. We didn't get enough radiation dose to the tumor this way. But what they did is they switched gears and they put uh, actinium-225 on it instead of lutetium-177. This is an alpha emitter. Alphas, uh, they, they emit, a, they, they, they give a much higher dose of radiation over a much shorter distance uh, and give a you know, larger dose. Now, that's not only to tumors, but to normal tissue. Uh, but you can see the absolutely remarkable response they had when we used an alpha emitter here. Uh, this is exciting. There's a lot of study, but we're very, very early in the alpha emitting uh, arena right now, but a lot of promise there. Okay, I'm going to finish up uh, with just a little bit of, of, of radiation safety uh, education here. And the way I'm going to start is just to let you know, as, as most of you do, that there is such a thing as background radiation. We can measure the amount of radiation that we're, we're getting. And we all get on the order of one millirem per day. And I'm just trying to use a millirem because it's a nice, uh, a nice thing. One per day is a nice, easy thing to remember. It just comes from the world around us. So what do we know about radiation? Well, we know if we get 500,000 millirem to your whole body at once, it'll likely kill you. Um, that's what happened at Chernobyl to the people who were working there and were in that high radiation environment for, uh, you know, for, for, too, for too long. So we know a lot of radiation absolutely will kill you. If we go down a factor of 10 from that to 50,000 millirem to your whole body at once, uh, we believe 
that there is a very slight increase in your risk of cancer. We have, we have some evidence that suggests that this is probably the case, but it's still not a slam dunk. Um, uh, and it is based largely on this, that we have set a limit for radiation workers like me, and like the technologists that work at the pet center and the nuclear medicine departments, and like the radiochemists, they can get 5,000 millirem per year uh, as their, every year for their, enti for their entire working life, sometimes 30 and 40 years. Um, and there is no direct evidence of risk at this level. We infer that there's risk from this higher dose. It's the reason we have these regulations in, but we try to go functionally a factor of 10 beneath this level where we, we probably are detecting something and that's where this comes from. If we look at cancer rates among radiation workers, um, they're the same or actually lower uh, than they are in the general population. Um, same thing actually with workers at, at, at nuclear power plants and the like. Most diagnostic imaging procedures, which is really what we're talking about today, are between 10 and 1,000 millirem. So you as a patient will likely be getting much less radiation uh, in your exam than our radiation workers are actually getting, uh, although, albeit over the course of, a, course of a year. And remember that one millirem per day is background radiation. Um, please understand that it's prudent for public safety to assume that every dose of ionizing radiation, no matter how small, might carry some small risk of unwanted health effects. This may not be true, but we assume this in our regulatory policy um, as we move forward. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there is a fair amount of data suggesting to the contrary that low levels of radiation may actually be beneficial. Well, there's a, uh, but we won't get into the hormesis hypothesis, but the, there, is, there is some data out there that suggests that. But regulations don't care about that. Regulations uh, are, are, are conservative. Um, just to give you an example, uh, better to look at the, the right side uh, than, than the left, a thyroid scan is about two weeks worth of background radiation, very small. Um, a lung scan or bone scan uh, are on the order of two to 400 millirem. And a, and a PET CT study is on the high end uh, with a PET with the CT uh, added on is somewhere between 1,100 and 1,500 millirem, uh, millirem these days. Still a factor of, of three to five lower than a radiation worker can get. And we work hard to try and keep these low, as low as we can. We, the amount of dose that we inject is, is, is enough to get a good image, but we don't want to give any, any more. These are kind of silly things to do to kind of come up and, and, and compare uh, compare risks. We'll spend a little bit more time on the, on the right side. Uh, the potential risk from for a secondary cancer from a PET scan uh, is about equivalent to your risk of, of dying, falling down the stairs over your lifetime. And the cancer from uh, from di getting cancer from uh, a bone scan uh, is, is equivalent approximately to dying from an accident while riding on a bike. These are pretty low compared to uh, compared to these compared to these other things. Um, the, the important thing to, uh, to remember, however, is the risk to the diagnostic imaging procedure isn't the major risk. The major risk is the disease that you have, right? I mean, you, you, you have cancer or you have heart disease or you have maybe have Alzheimer's disease. These are, these are, these are the, the big risks. Um, and what we're talking about is trying to get enough information to provide for your care. Um, and, uh, and so in all cases, we want to make sure that the benefit of the imaging study far outweighs any potential risk. If it doesn't, we shouldn't be doing the scan, right? So we try to keep the risk as far down as we possibly can. Um, every imaging procedure takes a certain amount of radiation to perform appropriately. This is well studied and we're working hard to even make it lower. Uh, that's what some of the scanner development is doing is to allow us to use lower dose. Um, using too much dose leads to unnecessary radiation dose in the patient. I would argue that one of the major risks uh, is if you use too little radiation, you may not provide much, en enough information. You get a crappy scan and we can't make the diagnosis and we can't treat you. If we miss that small metastasis because we tried to spare you this little tiny bit of radiation dose which has a very low risk, um, that, that's a problem, right? So uh, that's a, that may be harmful in and of itself. Uh, the imaging community in the SNMI is actively involved in monitoring dose and reducing dose by being engaged in the Image Gently and Image Wisely campaigns. Uh, they have a website uh, uh, where they can, where you can get information on this, to provide information both to patients and uh, and, and referring physicians. Uh, the last thing I just want to mention is a word about COVID uh, and and hospital safety right now. 
uh, in general, delaying necessary medical appointment, appointments, including imaging because of fear of COVID-19 exposure in the hospital environment is unwise. The hospitals are just about the safest places uh, around these days, although you might not, uh, may, not, may not think that on the outside. Uh, patients are screened going in. Uh, screening of patients uh, and employees at the entrance is done. We monitor for, for fever. We ask questions about medical history before anybody comes in. Um, and only people uh, who, are, who are patients or employees come in. Um, face shields are mandatory for all employees. Walking in this morning, every employee walking by that had a badge was wearing a face shield uh, in, in public areas. Uh, optimization, optimized use of telehealth. We're keeping traffic outside of the hospital. If patients have symptoms, we have a telehealth, uh, a telehealth uh, appointment first. Um, so we are the number of people walking around the hospital is probably a factor of three or four down. And anybody who has symptoms, we generally monitor long distance, so they don't even come into the hospital. They come into the hospital if they need treatment, but if they can be done and treated at home and monitored at home, we do that. Uh, social distancing practices are ubiquitous about the hospital. The waiting rooms have chairs further apart. Uh, everybody's uh, everybody's you know pretty much behaving themselves. And we've made uh, we've made changes to our procedures. If like we're doing scans, we disinfect all surfaces between between patients, all beds, all chairs. We've added an extra ten or fifteen minutes of cleaning procedures from one patient to the next. Um, so there's a lot being done. Um, so uh, so if you need if you need care. Uh, get it. Um, hospitals, for the most part, are pretty safe. And I think with that, I'll, inclu I'll, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, please, uh, I hope you en enjoyed and learned learn a little something, and, uh, and stay safe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sunderland. That was a great introduction to nuclear medicine. Just want to mention to everybody, Dr. Sunderland uh, noted a number of cancers, including neuroendocrine tumors, NETs, uh, we have two additional patient education day tracks coming up, one in two weeks and one in three weeks. On August 15th, we have neuroendocrine tumors, and on August 22nd, we have thyroid cancer. You can visit SNMMI patient education day website for more information. Also, a reminder to submit any questions in the Q&A box on your screen. We'll be addressing them at the end of all the sessions. So please go ahead and ask the questions. Again, they are anonymous. Now I'd like to introduce our next three speakers who will be discussing the role of nuclear medicine in diagnosing and treating prostate cancer. First, we'll hear from Dr. Winston Tam, who is a professor of medicine, a consultant in hematology, oncology, and genitourinary medical oncology, vice chair of hematology and oncology for education, and associate chair of the Department of Medicine for Faculty Development at Mayo Clinic, Florida. He is also Vice Chair of the Florida Society of Clinical Oncology. Next will be Dr. Ephraim Parent, Assistant Professor of Radiology at the Mayo Clinic and co-chairs the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging's Prostate Cancer Outreach Working Group. Finally, we will hear a patient's perspective from Mike Cosby. Mike Crosby, I'm sorry. Mike is the founder of Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness, Inc. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tan. Good afternoon. My name is Winston Tan. I'm professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. I'm a medical oncologist. Thank you for inviting me to this meeting and I hope I will help answer some of your questions from the oncologist's perspective. Today, I want to answer the how and why are scans relevant for an oncologist in the management of prostate cancer with the current treatment options. When we talk about prostate cancer, we often have three groups or three subsets of patients that we need to think about those with clinically, locally um, resectable or treatable disease. These are the patients who basically can be treated with surgery or radiation. These patients would require local treatment. And those patients in the second group will be, will be those who have what we call 
rising PSA or elevation of their PSA without any symptom. This is a subset of patient where they sometimes do not have metastasis yet, but elevation of the PSA. Very often, endocrine treatment uh, is an option, especially for those with rapid, rapid doubling time and elevation of the PSA. The next group would be those subset of patients who have now developed metastasis or have developed resistance to hormone treatment. And those patients would be the third group of patients that would be a group that we would treat with the different options. Today, our purpose is not to discuss the treatment options, but to discuss where imaging is necessary and where we could use imaging as a tool to help the clinician or the oncologist in the decision process. This is a classic CT scan. It shows that uh, we have an um, enlarged uh, lymph node and we're attempting to do a biopsy. So standard scans, despite its ability to look for metastasis, have limitations. This is to complicate things and just to show you that even when we have small areas of metastasis, we can have multiple molecular changes that are actually happening in the patient that we do not recognize, that we do not see, that we might not be aware of. Today, molecular testing has become a standard of care in the management of metastatic prostate cancer. So where does the two meet? We started with trying to look at the pathology. The other slide shows the molecular profile. This is just a standard slide where we try to classify how aggressive the prostate cancer is. To your left, we have the grade one, which appears to be very close to normal, their appearance. Well, if you look at number five, the cells are poorly differentiated, and that's what we call Gleason 5. And when we take a Gleason score, we add two most predominant sites and basically add the two score, give a score to the most predominant clone of cells. And usually it's a three plus three or four plus five Gleason prostate cancer. Understanding all this perspective based on molecular testing and standard pathologic findings, you can see and well appreciate that very often it would be too late when we see this kind of bone scan. This is a bone scan of a patient with metastatic prostate cancer, and it looks like every single bone have the cancer already spread to every place in the body. Very often these patients are debilitated have severe bone pain, and would need narcotics. What if we can make the diagnosis early? What if we can intervene early? What if we can change the course of the disease and maybe slow down the metastasis so that the consequences such as debilitation morbidity, and even mortality can be improved. Today, we have the ability to have better imaging. And I just told you earlier that we can merge the molecular ability of <clears throat> looking at things 
and lo and behold we have what we call molecular imaging choline pet scan and fluciclobin pet scan are approved by the fda these pet tracers uh, can actually be used to detect microscopic recurrences of prostate cancer whether it's in the prostatic bed or whether there's diffuse metastasis from the oncologist's point of view this is important because we can be more aggressive in treating those patients who have metastasis upfront and maybe change the course of the disease by early detection of this metastasis. This is the latest that was presented June 2020 at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, FDCFPYL, um, I would call it just FDCF. Um, this was a study of a new scan, which is PSMA tag, and uh, trying to determine the value of this new PSMA related scan and what's its utility in detecting prostate cancer in helping the clinician make decisions. So um, these are the different levels of PSA. You do recognize that most people with indolent disease would have low PSA, less than two, but um, this scan is quite sensitive in even though in patients with PSA 0.5 to 2, 60% um, to 82% of these patients can have positive scan. So it's a very sensitive test in detecting abnormalities. Patients in, in this study uh, will have uh, at least one abnormal lesion um, this have to be verified by biopsy or surgery, or these findings that they found on PET scan have to be verified with conventional imaging to correlate with this finding about 60 days after the PET scan, or post-radiation, a change by day 90. 208 patients were enrolled in this study, and to really make sure that there was no inter-reviewer variability, three reviewers were asked to review all the scans of these 208 patients, and there was concordance, at least 85 to 87% of the true positive in all the scan. First and foremost is that 63% of the patients had a change in the management of their prostate cancer. 78.65% had this change because of this positive test. Some of the changes that we clearly have seen from this study in those patients with localized disease, they were able to give salvage radiation in 23.5%, salvage systemic treatment in 28%, and in fact, they changed their decision from just absorbing those patients with low PSA into treatment with systemic treatment with chemotherapy with hormone treatment, 23.9%. And uh, some of those patients actually were de-escalated as far as plan to treat. Instead, some have to be observed because they did not find anything. And that was 4.4%. So with this testing, they were able to sort out who needs to be treated, and who does not need to be treated. So the conclusion is that this DCF PYL PET is more sensitive to this detect recurrent prostate cancer, patients with rising PSA, further utility 
and in the clinical setting has to be verified. This is not yet practice changing, but thought provoking in that early detection can change the management of these patients with prostate cancer. And this was verified by three reviewers, verified by scans, verified by biopsy, verified by surgery. Amazing detailed study. So where do we go from here? So we have better scans. Could we develop better therapies that basically are geared towards what we find on scan. That is called radioligand therapy. And with radioligand therapy, you can see here that <clears throat> there is a chelator here, and uh, there's gallium 68, um, which is the diagnostic portion to look for those PSMA uh, positive uh, abnormalities on the PET scan. And we have the Lutetera or uh, 177, which is the radioisotope used for treatment. Now, with diagnosing those patients to have a positive PSMA scan, there is an experimental tool using lutetium 177 where we can treat the places of abnormality of the prostate cancer, the spread of the prostate cancer. And this is just an illustration. This was a PSMA positive scan using the gallium method. We can clearly see that uh, this patient had diffuse metastasis to the bones, to the lymph nodes, and <clears throat> to all over the spine. And after three treatment of the PSMA radioligand, now you can see clear cut disappearance of all those metastases. PSA was almost 3,000, treating them with this three times actually made their PSA to 0 0.26, which is amazing. And with further treatment, the PSA was undetectable. So there is a role for trying to do this experimentally right now as a tool to hopefully bring hope to our patients who have diffuse metastasis. Therefore, the vision trial um, is being actively done and is supposed to be completed late this year. And patients uh, are randomized to receive the experimental drug, lutetium 617 intravenously every six weeks for a maximum of six cycles. And after four cycles, patients would be assessed for evidence of response, residual disease tolerance to the uh, treatment drug. And if all assessments are met, patient will receive two cycles of the experimental drug. This is a randomized placebo-controlled study um, that is currently ongoing. So what I did show you earlier is that indeed there is a role of better imaging combination of imaging and therapeutics in the setting of metastatic disease. However, for, our, for an oncologist, what's more exciting is actually how can we prevent metastasis? This had not been heard of until about three to four years ago, where in prostate cancer, our goal is to prevent metastasis. And that's what we call metastasis-free survival. Now we have a cancer that's coming back biochemically, just in the blood. How can we prevent metastasis? Based on the three trials, we have the PROSPER, the Spartan, and the Aramis trial. All of these trials have shown that we can actually prevent 
uh, metastasis or delay metastasis and indeed with follow-up this year it has been shown that we can actually improve survival in patients with biochemical recurrence patients with fast doubling time less than 10 months patients with no metastasis just PSA elevation we can delay that progression significantly by almost 20 months and even cure some of those subsets of patients and improve survival there are side effects like anything however those side effects are quite manageable uh, with active surveillance and watching of the patient these are the drugs that are approved for castrate resistant metastatic prostate cancer I would suggest to you that both molecular testing and imaging are important to help you decide why you need to go from one drug to another or when you need to go from one drug to another nowadays we can test for circulating tumor cells nowadays we can have better imaging so hopefully these tools can help us the more tools we have we can have a better way of making decision in the future of how and when we need to go to the next drug thank you i hope i highlighted to you that there is a role for imaging in early recurrent prostate cancer and also in late stage metastatic prostate cancer and my goal is basically to open your eyes and make sure that you are aware of these ongoing processes that are being done that would create hope for every patient with prostate cancer there is always light in the tunnel and today is that day thank you very much that ends my talk and uh, the next speaker would be dr ephraim parent he will highlight the options of imaging in different stages of prostate cancer thank you very much and have a good day Hello, my name is Ephraim Parent. I'm an assistant professor of radiology at Mayo Clinic, Florida. And today I'm going to be talking to you about molecular imaging and its role that it plays with the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer. So to start out with, um, I'm going to first discuss some terms that I'm going to use to describe some of these imaging agents because I think it's important to understand very briefly uh, how we describe these and how they work. Um, I'm going to, after that, talk about the main four classes of imaging that we can be using in terms of molecular imaging for prostate cancer. Um, FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose, choline, axiomen, and then PSMA imaging. Um, and then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about bone imaging and um, kind of discuss overall how these all play in a role of how we can help the treating physician uh, understand how best to provide the appropriate therapy. So there's a few things that we need to understand so we're all on the same page when, when we describe these things. There's a, there's a term called sensitivity. And, and when we say that, it, it's the ability of this detection or test to, to be able to find all true lesions. So really what we're trying to do when we do imaging of prostate cancer is to say, this is where cancer is um, and it could be changing how it's growing and, and other things like that but really we want to know what's really there and then specificity is really to where the ability to exclude false disease meaning that if it is negative there really is nothing there so it's that kind of combination of the sensitivity and specificity that's overall going to give us our accuracy or you know our ability to really give a complete picture of the spread of disease and where it is uh, growing or, or being treated appropriately. 
There's another term that I'll be using a lot called a radiopharmaceutical radiotracer. These are the agents that we'll be using with uh, nuclear medicine molecular imaging. And, and in fact, what it is is simply we have a radioactive isotope that is just kind of the marker. It gives off some light that our cameras can identify. And that's attached to another molecule. And it's that molecule itself that's going to be binding to the different receptors and things like that. That's going to be able to allow us to identify where prostate cancer is. PET uh, is, a, is a term not for our little friends, but uh, the, it's the cameras that we use called positron emission tomography. It's not really important to understand how uh, or how this works, but really understand that it's a way that we can accurately identify um, where the, uh, the radio pharmaceuticals are localizing for the, for the prostate cancer. And then SPECT is another term that we can use. And primarily we use this with bone imaging agents or our radiotheranostics. And that kind of brings us into our last creation with radiotheranostic. These are radio pharmaceuticals that have a special type of isotope, but it's not used necessarily for imaging, but we're able to deliver therapeutic radiation, um, either alpha or beta particle, um, most generally. And these give, uh, you know, in terms of, it, it, it's analogous to giving external beam radiation therapy, but we're giving it localized to the uh, prostate cancer. And I'll be going into more detail about exactly how that's achieved. Well, prostate cancer is a very, um, it, it's, it's had a many decades of people trying to image this and get a grasp of how we identify this. Um, I used to love hiking uh, when I lived in uh, Atlanta. I go up in the mountains in the, in the um, Appalachian Mountains, and this is a picture from a mountain up there. And if I wanted to get up to that mountain that you can kind of see in the distance, how do I get there? That's now I guess of how do I image where the cancer is? Um, and I need to have that uh, kind of blueprint to understand to where to get there. And that is where we have the appropriate map. So if I wanted to go traveling there, I'd want to be using that map. And just like with each of these radio pharmaceuticals, they're not all the same, but they give us a general blueprint of, uh, or you know, a kind of a guideline of how to identify if something is real or if it's cancer or not. Um, but if we use the wrong radio pharmaceutical, we can see that this wouldn't help. So this is a map of the male campus. And if I wanted to go hiking in the mountains, this map won't help me. And that's analogous to having a wrong radio pharmaceutical. It's not going to really help us to identify it. So there's this been this kind of really dedicated efforts over the last several decades of trying to find what is the best radio pharmaceutical to accurately identify where um, metastatic prostate cancer is. So why, you know, how does this fit into the whole picture? So this is a very broad topic, and, and I'm going to concentrate primarily on biochemical recurrent disease because that's what most of these uh, imaging mechanisms are identifying. Basically, biochemical recurrence is where you have the PSA or prostate-specific antigen where it's rising after definitive treatment, either prostatectomy or radiation therapy or what have you. And that is a laboratory value that's telling us that there is some prostate cancer that's growing. It doesn't tell us where it is, we just know that it's there. And so with molecular imaging, we are trying to identify where that is. And what we see a lot of times with prostate cancer traditionally is that um, there is almost, not always, but very commonly, we're going to have this biochemical recurrent disease after the initial therapy. And it could be that we're finding out is that we're not identifying where all the disease is. And so with these really state-of-the-art uh, radiopharmaceuticals and molecular imaging techniques, we're able to identify better where disease is not only pre-therapy, but also post-therapy. For the sake of this kind of short period of time, I'm going to be talking about pretty much this post-therapy. So we're identifying disease that's biochemical recurrence. I'm not going to be talking about the initial staging um, just for the sake of time. So the first thing that many people may be aware of, but we don't typically use for prostate cancer is FDG. This is a glucose analog, and it goes to tissues that have high metabolic activity. And we use this for many tumors, uh, uh, lymphoma, breast cancer, lung cancer. It's kind of a generic thing. We don't use it too much for prostate cancer because typically we find that prostate cancer cells don't rely on sugar as much for their energy as other energy substrates, such as li lipids or uh, proteins. We can occasionally see this, um, and such as this is a case in here that I was reading that he had lymphoma, and we noticed that in the prostate there is this focus of increased uptake. And it had a uptake there that was 
greater than what we would expect normally. And in fact, it turned out to be prostate cancer. So sometimes we will see prostate cancer using FDG, but it doesn't do a very good job in identifying where nodal disease is. And, and again, it's not standard of care, but it may be a segue to be having a more dedicated uh, imaging, which is more now standard of care. Uh, this was one of the first uh, agents that was kind of approved by the FDA for imaging prostate cancer after uh, FTG. Um, and what it does is it's, a, it's a, a mechanism to identify where the uptake is uh, in terms of the phospholipids. Again, we don't really need to worry about how the mechanism is taking place, but it's kind of an, uh, it's, it's an agent that goes to tissues that are rapidly dividing their membranes, which they need to do if they're growing, and this is typically seen with prostate cancer. So this works a pretty this works pretty well in identifying where nodal and other types of metastatic prostate cancer can take place. This is a patient that we imaged um, on a PET MRI, and I've highlighted a, a lymph node in the iliac chain that is really not that big, but you can see the green arrow is showing that there's intense uptake here, and this was found to be consistent with uh, prostate cancer, and so. This is a good agent that, that we use um, often at the institute where I'm at, but other places around the nation, um, and it's FDA approved to be looking for biochemical, event, so bi biochemical recurrent prostate cancer. Um, this just shows kind of the pathway. The concept behind it is that it's kind of going to uh, the cell membrane, and so these prostate cancer cells that are dividing rapidly are going to take up more of this radio tracer and thus we can identify where there's evidence of uh, nodal or metastatic disease. The next one I'm gonna be talking about briefly is also an FDA approved agent called Axamen or Fluciclovine. Um, this is a non-natural amino acid. I have a structure here. Um, and what it is, it goes, it gets in, taken up into cells through these uh, amino acid channels uh, because cells need proteins to grow. And even though it's not incorporated into the, the cellular structure, it kind of stays in the, the cellular uh, res uh, reservoir for a while. And we're able to take advantage of these cells that are kind of rapidly dividing because and they're thus needing more protein, and we can identify prostate cancer. This is a case where this person had a relatively low level PSA of, of 1.0, but it was a fairly rapid dividing time. Um, and we can see there, there's this lymph node and um, it's kind of that bright spot uh, that you see in the middle of the belly there. Uh, and, and this lymph node was actually found to be consistent with nodal metastatic disease and they resected it. And after that, his uh, PSA levels went back down to baseline. And I think this goes, shows a good example of if we can identify just a few areas, we could either be treating them with radiation therapy or surgical excision to really be treating this. Um, and this uh, is, again, why we're doing it. It's not just to say, oh, yes, we know where there is disease, but can we effectively treat this? Both of these agents, choline and fluciclovine, even though they have different mechanisms, they have similar um, patterns of uptake and imaging uh, criteria. One thing that we see is that in patients that still have a prostate cancer, there's other areas of, kind of you can get false positives, such as prostatitis or benign prostate hyperplasia, um, such as in the first two images here. And, and that can have a similar appearance to prostate cancer. So sometimes there will be evidence of, of disease and we, we might say in our report, this may be consistent, but it really needs to be evaluated with an MRI. And, and it's important to understand, uh, I'm gonna be getting onto other imaging techniques, but a lot of times, you know, there's not like a perfect imaging test. Sometimes we are very confident that, that either disease is present or not but we also are going to rely on other imaging techniques such as MRI or other type of molecular imaging to be conclusive if that's gonna change therapy. Um, I just wanted to talk uh, a very brief slide about how we image these. Uh, both choline and fluciclovine uh, have a short uptake time. So instead of a delayed 60 minute image, which we pretty much do with everything else, we inject the radiopharmaceutical while the patient's on the table and then we image starting in the pelvis and going up and we get the whole imaging done in about you know, 30 minutes with modern scanners. And, and we're able to then identify, uh, given the, you know, the, the individual uh, uptake patterns of where nodal disease is, if there's potential disease in the prostate bed or elsewhere in the disease or elsewhere in the skeleton or, or, or anywhere else in the body. 
I'm now going to be talking very briefly about PSMA. So this is a very exciting um, molecular imaging technique, and, and it's involving a, um, a protein called a prostate-specific membrane antigen. And we don't really have to worry too much about its role in prostate cancer, but we do know that it's overexpressed in about 95% of prostate cancers, either low-grade and high-grade. It's very commonly seen. And it kind of straddles that membrane, the, the, this extracellular membrane. And, and these PSMA agents will bind to the extracellular epitope, and we can then identify where prostate cancer is. Um, it is important to note that none of these agents right now are FDA approved. Um, so here in the United States, it is, while well, there, there are many sites that are imaging with this, they are all research protocols. The only agent that is currently FDA approved is Prostacin, but that is off the market. Um, and it is, it's a different mechanism, but uh, just understand that at this moment is a April or August 1st, 2020, there are no FDA approved PSMA agents. But I wanna talk about it because these, this is a very powerful way to not only image, but potentially deliver therapy to patients with metastatic prostate cancer. These are uh, two patients that had two different types of uh, PSMA. There's different types of isotopes. They could be F18, gallium-68. There's, there's many different, carbon-11. Um, and they have different kind of flavors of how their normal behavior is. Overall, they're very similar. They all have very high abilities to detect prostate cancer with high specificity. Um, but there is a little bit of nuance of how you read them. And, Again, as none of these are FDA approved, it's a little bit of, uh, I, I don't want to get lost in the weeds. Um, that would be more kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but understand it's kind of like vanilla. You can have Mexican vanilla, you can have vanilla bean. There's all these type of vanilla aspects, but they're still vanilla. There are some subtle differences, but they all behave fairly similarly. It is pretty well established um, that PSMA agents probably do a better job than the current FDA-approved agents, choline and flucyclovine, especially when there's low PSA levels, meaning where there's not a lot of biochemical evidence of recurrent disease. And at these low levels, the PSMA agents, and there's been a few studies that have compared both to Axman, flucyclovine, or Cape choline, and have shown greater sensitivity in identifying these kind of uh, oligometastatic or just a few areas of metastatic disease. And, and this is a big reason why people are very excited about it, that we're able to now truly identify patients with a very high uh, sensitivity and accuracy where they have metastatic disease. Um, so this is something that is going to be important going down the road because we anticipate many of these will be FDA approved. But does that mean that choline or flucyclovine are not good? No, absolutely not. We actually do very good jobs of it evaluating people with both choline and flucyclovine. And, and it's much better than other things that are on the way. So it's kind of in a spectrum here. So the, the FDG or some other techniques that I haven't talked about have kind of fallen out of favor. But the current agents that we have have very strong evidence of being able to detect prostate cancer metastases with a very high accuracy. It's just the next level that we're looking at with going to PSMA. And really, this is going to lead into our next thing, because it's not just that we can now identify a lymph node or something like that. But what we wanted, what we can do with these agents is because of how they're designed, we can actually do radiotheranostic scan. And, and what we can do is instead of having an isotope that's tagged to these pharmaceuticals, we can actually take a uh, beta emitting or alpha emitting radio tracer, and we can then tie this to this that will then be delivering therapeutic radiation to the prostate cancer itself. So this is kind of just an example of showing in, in image A, somebody that had a PSMA PET image. And then we can give them this therapeutic uh, agent that's tied with this beta emitter lutetium-177. And you can see basically the same areas that had uptake on the PSMA agent now have uptake of this therapeutic agent and is delivering therapeutic radiation to those tissues that have prostate cancer while sparing the normal non-involved tissue. So it's a relatively benign way to get radiation therapy to these patients. And what's very exciting is that there's a lot of evidence out there that these things can be very effective, not just in treating a radiographic or where we no longer see the disease, but the PSA and the other biochemical evidence disease goes down dramatically. 
Um, and again, none of these are yet FDA approved, but there's a lot of research out there and we expect them over the next few years to be approved. I don't know when. Um, that is a kind of a, a different discussion beyond the scope of this, but it is something that is very exciting for the field to be able to be using this um, because it can treat not just osseous disease, but soft tissue disease as well with very high success rates. And the, one should note that there is not just what well, we don't want to just knock it out, but we want to show that people are living longer and have a better quality of lives. And that's what a lot of the current research is doing is trying to figure out the outcomes of this, because what we want is not just to have a nice picture, but we want to show that once we treat people that they actually have outcomes. And so that's kind of where the research is right now is evaluating these individual agents and just showing that the outcomes are better. Um, I'm going to just spend a, a, just a minute talking about bone imaging because despite all this molecular imaging, there's still a big uh, part of uh, bone imaging, which has been going on for decades, where we're really just evaluating disease within the bones. Prostate cancer, for whatever reason, um, loves going to bones. And about 80% of patients that eventually die of prostate cancer will actually have a disease uh, within the bones. And so it's very important to identify where they have disease. These agents here, MDP and sodium fluoride, uh, have been around for quite a while, and they're both used to identify osseous metastatic disease with a high uh, degree of accuracy. These are kind of classic pictures that we see, and um, the picture on the left, this oligometastatic, meaning there's just a few areas of uptake, it's pretty easy to see. There's these bright spots that will show up a red arrow, and you can see these areas that are lighting up, and this is where we have prostate cancer, and we can use these studies over time to understand how the therapy is working. For the next picture, this extensive osseous metastatic disease, it's harder to identify specific lesions, but really this patient has disease throughout the skeleton, and that's a lot of times what we see with prostate cancer is because it goes to bones with such uh, veracity that it can almost replace all the bony disease. And this is, again, why skeletal imaging is so important. And we will want to be imaging these uh, patients often over time. This is something that gives a relatively low level of radiation and, and is relatively low cost, and we can identify how things are working. And here, um, the three images that I have is the same person and kind of this going up and down levels of PSA depending on the therapies working. Um, and that can sometimes be related to hormonal therapy, other types of therapies, but it's just a good way and a very common way that pretty much everybody with prostate cancer has had at some point a, a bone imaging test. And it is unlikely, even in the cases of PSMA and other things that'll be going away anytime soon, just because it's a very robust uh, agent that's been uh, studied for a long period of time. The one, this is the, this is the last thing I want to talk about with this. As with everything, we want to confirm sometimes. So this this is a patient. This is kind of the last thing I'm going to show is a patient with fluciclovine PET on the left that had an uptake in this left iliac bone. Um, he didn't have a correlate on the CT, but what we didn't know is if this is real disease or if it's a false positive. As I said, no, none of these uh, agents are perfect. There, there's nothing that's infallible, and and we want to make sure if we're going to be giving radiation or changing therapy that something's real. And a lot of times, then we can identify or use another type of agent, such as in this case on the right, somebody with dedicated bone imaging, sodium fluoride, or MRI, or something else to confirm if something is real or not. Um, and in this particular case, this person, this, this uptake in the left iliac bone did not have any uptake on the sodium fluoride, it was negative, and it was considered a false positive study. Um, and overall, this is the end of my talk, and what I wanted to just, again, kind of do an overview of molecular imaging, the, the topic is vast. There's really, it's not possible to really discuss everything because you could drill down on a single subject and have a, an hour long discussion. But I think this gives a very good overview of where this field is, where it's gonna be going, and, uh, in, and there's going to be things, uh, you know, 20 years down the road that we have not yet thought of. Um, thank you for your time. And I'm going to turn the time over right now to Mike Crosby, who's the founder of the Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness Group. Thank you. Hi, I'm Commander Mike Crosby, uh, retired United States Navy. I uh, am the chairman and CEO, founder of... Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness. I founded this organization, a personal journey with prostate cancer, and we're here to talk to you about what the VA is doing with uh, in, the, in the form of support for veterans with prostate cancer. Today, there are 
over 20 million veterans that have served our country uh, in the United States today. Of that 20 million, 9 million are receiving care in the VHA system. It's the largest integrated healthcare system really on the planet today. And there are some great strides being made, uh, both in nuclear medicine and, and a lot of other areas inside the VA. Uh, but today, let's talk about prostate cancer, and, and really 7 million of those men are of the target age of 40. So that's our, our population that we focus with Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness. We're trying to reach out to all of those guys to let them uh, know that they should be screening and that they should be aware of this disease. Uh, today, there are about 13,000 men diagnosed every year inside the VA, uh, and Currently, the VA is actually taking care of or seeing 48, 489,000, so almost half a million men inside the VA with over 16,000 of those cases being metastatic. And one of the troubling issues is 14% of those 16,000 uh, are actually metastatic, determined to be metastatic on the first diagnosis. And that's something that uh, is double the, uh, the, popula the general populations from the SEER data, uh, which is really a population uh, average or epidemiology study. When people say nuclear medicine, uh, really the first thing that comes to mind if you're a veteran uh, is really not medicine and, and at a molecular level. We're, we're talking about uh, nuclear uh, and as a huge level. And I think that if we can translate this picture into what I believe is the impact that nuclear medicine can have on prostate cancer, I think it's going to be one of the keys to making significant and really life-changing uh, changes in how we treat and how we diagnose and, and actually stage the cancer. So really, when I formed this organization four years ago, our mission, we came up with, uh, with really three main purposes. One is to raise uh, awareness amongst active duty and veteran population. Uh, bring education uh, to the to the customer, to the consumer, or to that population, and uh, and focus the veterans on what are the proper care and treatment alternatives for prostate cancer, and then also uh, promote what technologies are available for the treatment and the cure of this to both veterans and and also very importantly the healthcare providers, the the people that are in the industry, both everywhere from nursing staff to the researchers to the actual oncologists and uh, you know, radiation specialists and nuclear medicine specialists. I mean, what is going on? We need, you guys don't have enough time or the, the people that are uh, actually uh, developing these technologies don't have time really always to collaborate in, a, in an effective manner. And that we see that as a, as a patient concerned with this. One of our contributions is to try to network and bring those people together. One of the things I found is that um, we think that all of these, you know, recent medical advances really uh, fit into our mission and objectives, both uh, educating patients and also the, the staff and, uh, and basically other uh, professionals that are providing uh, the, the uh, treatment for veterans. Now, for example, the PSMA PET evolution, right? I mean, we, we can talk about the 11C choline tests all the way to the uh, the F-18 tests that are out there available. I mean, there's been a whole hierarchy and a whole rapid evolution of these developments, but that evolution has been within a matter of really months. I mean, we're not talking uh, decades here of the development of this technology. I mean, these things are moving very, very quickly. And while we're doing imaging, we know that the next step down the line is probably going to be you know, the delivery of actual medications uh, and, and hopefully life-saving medications to, to patients uh, with prostate cancer. As far as advocacy, I am a user of nuclear medicine. Um, I'm currently going through uh, prostate cancer treatment on a, in a recurrence type of a mode. Uh, I am a strong believer that uh, the proper application of this technology can change the management of your disease. Um, this recurrence that I'm dealing with now Actually, I had an exumin uh, uh, scan in September of 2018. Uh, then I had the uh, PSMA with the gallium 68. And then most recently this year, I've had the, uh, the F-18. And the reason why is that uh, as I've had to go to different facilities and 
as I've gone, I've had the opportunity to be offered these through either studies and clinical trials. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm blessed with that to have access to some of the, the best guys in the world that are, are doing this thing. The Exumin scan actually found a single lymph node involvement uh, back in 18. It was treated uh, after the gallium 68 uh, with an SBRT. Uh, it found, I guess, the gallium found a better, a little bit better uh, resolution, but it was still the, the same same course. And then most recently in February, uh, my PSA had had come back and started to rise again, and we've now found two lymph nodes uh, in addition to that one. And um, my prostate decided that it would uh, stay alive after being treated before, and it's showing a in the F18 uh, PSMA. Uh, chemistry. And so that decision or that discovery immediately changed uh, my management plans. I mean, I went right to a systemic ADT with Extandi. Uh, we're now going to go back and do SBRT to those lymph nodes and then either a brachytherapy or a, a new uh, fusion laser ablation. But it led to uh, another uh, biopsy, uh, which found um, uh, Gleason uh, 8 uh, prostate cancer. And so uh, we've got to make some some decisions, right? And, and the question I ask myself all the time is, you know, what if we imaged newly diagnosed patients, right, to determine where they were in the whole staging program? Uh, if, if we were using nuclear medicine on initial diagnosis, um, how would that better the treatment plans and, and the staging plans for anybody that uh, that succumbs to this disease. And I, I, I truly believe that it would make a significant difference. And so I'm a cheerleader for that. And um, I know it's changed mine in a very positive way. And so, uh, and I know my, my grandkids think the same thing. Okay, so where do we think the future of nuclear medicine is going? Um, it's true that early screening is going to lead to earlier detection of prostate cancer. Uh, I believe that um, that the development of the nuclear medicine and these PSMA scans or whatever's coming next uh, is going to help increase the viability of earlier treatment options, which we all know decreases the probability of toxicity post-treatment, and it also increases the probability of cure. Um, it's also, there's a mindset, uh, I think, uh, in the community that, you know, if we can see it, we, we can fight. And uh, PSMA has shown me, and it's actually the visualization of prostate cancer. I mean, there's, you can't feel prostate cancer. It, it, it's the silent disease. And so what happens is guys go too long or they don't, they don't have any side effects or they don't recognize the side effects. And if, if it's diagnosed early enough, I mean, after the, the early screening from a blood blood test or other developments, uh, tests of coming, once you're diagnosed with it, if you do these PSMA screens, and I, I think um, these PSMA imaging, I think that it's going to allow the physicians and it's going to be a game changer in how we actually map out or how we prescribe the, the treatments in the future. Um, I, I think it's going to also allow us to be more effective in staging of the disease and actually understanding where it's at and what it's at instead of guessing or as we used to just take a PSA. I think the physicians and oncologists would agree that it usually should just be based off a number and it was we all called it slow growing and you know maybe you'd get it, maybe you wouldn't. And based on your age, you would select what treatment you're going to get. I think that that's not the case anymore. I think they're We've understood that there's very aggressive diseases out there in some cases and uh, and need to be treated uh, aggressively as well. So we need to understand what, what we're dealing with. And, and the nuclear medicine techniques uh, are key to doing that, to allowing both physicians and patients to understand what they're dealing with. Um, it's also, I hope in the future, and I've, I've seen studies and, uh, and trials uh, for delivery options of, of allowing the nuclear medicine components to be a delivery option for certain medications. Uh, this is going to allow to take allow the, the uh, physicians to actually take that medication and deliver it right to the cancer. So almost, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about revolutionary ways to deal with with cancer and that is to to treat the exact spot in your body that has this 
this disease state, and you may not even know it. Uh, you may not even see that that's right where it's at, but instead of treating your whole body systemically, we can actually target and personalize uh, that, that individual delivery of medications that, that really are, are targeted for that, that one patient. This year, uh, Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness has, uh, has teamed with Zero, the end of prostate cancer, uh, the largest patient advocacy organization. And I'm going to uh, run through these slides quickly because uh, you can you need to go to the website at uh, zerocancer.org or vetsprostate.org, and you can find a number of uh, outreach uh, components and platforms that we have. Um, there's a we have a, a number of things on Facebook, about 26,000 users. You can see the Twitter fo Twitter followers at 10,500, and Instagram. And we'd love to hear from everybody. In the community, uh, Zero is, uh, participates in, in a lot of different uh, national run walk events. We've had to go virtual this year because of the COVID issues. We, uh, we have uh, about 575 local advocates and 2,200 patient and caregivers. These, uh, these are people that are dedicated to bringing a change into the prostate cancer world. I mean, it's, uh, I, try to tell people that uh, this year or next year, we need to be making blue the new pink, okay? And it's, uh, you'll hopefully hear that again, and that uh, we need to raise awareness because we are looking at, at large numbers and they're increasing uh, every year. I mean, the numbers of diagnoses are increasing at, at a fairly steady rate. So the websites are at the bottom. We encourage both everyone to, to uh, on the call and anybody that you know is dealing with prostate cancer to please go to those websites and sign up and, and help out at zerocancer.org slash veterans and uh, vetsprostate.org. What we've done, we've also achieved a number of things on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have supported the uh, uh, legislation with the Mission Act and also the Veterans Prostate Cancer Treatment and Research Act, uh, which was introduced in January of 2020. Uh, there's a military pilot's cancer incident study that was introduced uh, in late last year that's been encompassed into the National Defense Authorization Act, which is really the DOD's budget for this year that was just passed by the House in, the, in early July. We're waiting. Hopefully, this won't be vetoed. Uh, I think there's a more than a, there's a, a, a veto uh, coverage for this, and it, and we can move on with it. But there's a study on incidents of cancer diagnosis and mortality among military aviators and support personnel. We're seeing a very high incidence rate or a supposed high incidence, and we really are gonna work this year. So we're, we are very active along with Zero. It's one of the reasons why VPCA teamed with Zero. We think uh, we need to bring awareness to this, this issue amongst uh, met veterans and a higher incidence rate. So if you know a vet, tell them to get screened, and that's really the big message is that uh, we don't know where it's coming from, but they need to get screened and the earlier they do and the earlier, earlier they find it, the more options they have to cure it. Here are our patient resources. It's available on this slide. It's also available on the Zero website. Uh, you can also contact me or any of the other uh, uh, members here, the, the officials at uh, Society for Nuclear Medicine, and we will make sure that, uh, that you get to the right person if you're dealing with prostate cancer or are interested in any of these assets. So I want to thank you uh, very much for your time today. Uh, again, there, you can see it's obvious why uh, Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness has partnered with Zero, the end of prostate cancer. Uh, it gives us a national outreach almost immediately across all 50 states. And uh, we really hope to, uh, to make a difference in this year. We had bigger plans than uh, what we're having to uh, deal with with COVID, but I appreciate time in this, this virtual environment. And I'd like to turn it over now, uh, turn it back to uh, the organizers. And again, thank you for your time today. And please support uh, Zero and Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness. Thanks so much, Mike, for sharing a very personal story with all of us and also for founding Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness and uh, as a new member of the Patient Advocacy Advisory Board. Also, I want to thank Dr. Tan and Dr. Parent. This has been a terrific session. We really appreciate your time, especially on a Saturday afternoon, to share this with patients and caregivers. And most important, I want to thank you for both really for your commitment to your profession and patients and making a difference in so many lives. Also, on behalf of the Patient Advocacy Advisory Board, we want to thank 
SNMMI for its commitment and support of the patient population and today's Patient Education Day. So let's see if we have any questions. Okay, let's see. Are there still issues about residual effects of gadolinium in MRI? Thank you. Let's see. So I think I think we know who's going to take that one. So um, they're, you know, going back, I don't remember exactly when the initial reports were, but there is, uh, patients were getting gadolinium enhancement, um, and primarily this was seen, uh, sorry, they're getting gadolinium enhancement for their MRI examinations, and they're finding patients that had recurrent MRI studies on, on autopsy, or also they had um, symptoms called a nephrogenic uh, system, nephrogenic uh, fibrosis. And what it was found was that gadolinium was being deposited at very low levels in the blood um, and in the, in the tissues. And on autopsy, they would see this in brains and things like that. Um, and this has been kind of changed that overall, the, the agents that we use now are very much more stable. The, the agents that they were finding this in were kind of ignoring the chemistry. They were kind of single dentate or single uh, linkers to bind the gadolinium to the agent, and now they're kind of these multi-dentate cage type structures that bind gadolinium much closer. And the patients that had problems with this were those that had severe renal failure. So, um, you know, when, when basically their kidneys were not working and thus not able to excrete the gadolinium. And it was also in patients that had multiple repeat MRI examinations. And these are pretty much uh, like patients with uh, brain tumors like glioblastoma that have multiple, multiple, multiple repeat MRI examinations. So overall today, we still want to check a patient's renal function before we give gadolinium, um, but they uh, use um, uh, um, the, the gadolinium uh, pretty safely for prostate cancer. And um, as long, and, and there haven't been any reports of uh, this nephrogenic fibrosis uh, in many years because of the better screening and the better agents that we're using. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one more question here. PSMA PET CT that found possible bone mets in a rib. Is there a scan you would recommend to clarify the results of the PSMA scan? So when we're looking at these things, we find these areas of bony disease, and if we're not 100% certain, um, and, and just to clarify this a little bit, what helps us if we're doing a PET CT is if there's like a sclerotic lesion or some other kind of CT change, then it can be very positive and like, oh yes, we know this is cancer. But sometimes we'll see these areas of maybe amorphous uptake and it's not exactly certain what it is. In the ribs, you can have things like fractures that we didn't know, you know, have trauma, you can have these uptake. So there's several different uh, other anatomic or uh, biochemical or molecular imaging that we can do. And the ribs are probably a little bit hard. I would recommend just doing a, a MDP a bone scintigraphy. This is something I talked about. It's kind of very common. And you can see what the pattern is. And overall, it does a very good job of looking at the whole skeleton at one time to get a sense of if something is real. Um, and probably in the ribs, if the CT is not definitive for it, I think the bone scan is to see maybe there's something else that you can help identify. I do recommend that if we see something like um, in the spine or the pelvis or something like that and we're not certain, an MRI with contrast is really the best agent to do to be able to identify those because you'll be able to have, if, if that lesion is real and is having uptake, you'll be able to have a correlate on MRI. Um, it's not that there is always, uh, you know, like if you see something, you need to do something else. It's kind of a case by case basis. But again, I would say either a bone scan or MRI is going to be the best study. Okay, we have another question here. What is best at determining pelvis local recurrence? MRI of pelvis, systemic PET, choline, PSMA, or flu, uh, flu, flu, cyclovine, sodium acetate, sodium fluoride? They're all good. Um, so the, the question I would ask is, well, can we combine these? So at, at Mayo Clinic, we're doing uh, many uh, PET MRIs. So we're, we're combining the choline or fluciclovine PET with the MRI contrast enhancement. So you get a complete evaluation, diagnostic evaluation of the pelvis, and are then able to tie in the, um, the molecular imaging that you're getting from the radiopharmaceutical to really have a high accuracy and high specificity of what is real and what's not real. So 
if I, so that'd be like my ideal technique. PET CT is totally fine and MR by itself are totally fine. There's no reason to have to do both. I'm just saying that it is something that you can do. In terms of those radiopharmaceuticals, um, they're all good. And I would, I would say it really depends on where you are at. If you're at an institution that has a PSMA study, I think those are, I, I, I don't have any reason why not to do that. Um, if you're also at an institution that's doing choline or fluciclovine, those are totally acceptable as well. Acetate um, was an agent that works pretty well. It's been kind of off, not used outside of kind of research settings for a while, because mainly because of the difficulty in synthesizing it. Um, it worked fine and it'd be fine doing it. But I think overall right now, you know, there, there's not, if somebody had say a fluciclovine study, I wouldn't say that they needed to go get a, uh, a PSMA study. That, that is something that um, unless there is some real evidence that they're missing something, I think they're still pretty good. Um, and, and just the last comment on this, I think the real power of PSMA is where you have low PSA levels of less than one. That's where PSMA really has shown its power in being able to identify a disease. Right. And I know that the, this next question is something Dr. Sunderland talked about, COVID-19, but the question came up, how is the air cleaned? in a CT scanner between patients. I think talking about all of cleanliness and disinfection, uh, if you can do that. So um, again, this is probably gonna depend institution to institution, um, but we, uh, everybody that has scanned, you know, you have the, the, the kind of the plastic sheeting and, and kind of rubber on the scan itself. And then uh, everybody is gonna, we're gonna have a, uh, you know, a uh, cotton sheet and a pillow on that. So uh, you, and it, when you're actually being scanned, you're not actually ever touching the machine. That being said, you know, all that, that bedding material gets rewashed and re-laundered, and then it's the, 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 the mat and everything else around the skin is wiped down in between each, uh, uh, in between each patient. Um, and, and this, again, you know, it, it, I think pretty much all hospitals are taking this very seriously because uh, with COVID, we already were doing this, but we're, it's kind of re-dedicating uh, to making sure that there's, there's very, very little chance of having any uh, possible contagion from one patient to the next. Mike, do you want to share any of your personal stories about feeling, uh, walk into an environment where, where you, you knew it was, uh, where there weren't any issues? Sure. No, I, I've in all the facilities that I've been to, uh, and I've been where I've been is UCLA, uh, also the West LA VA, um, the uh, uh, Stevenson Cancer Center, Cancer Institute in uh, Oklahoma City, and everybody has been uh, very uh, attentive to the cleanliness. And I think uh, it was mentioned earlier in, in the uh, discussion that really the hospitals, I, I have to commend, especially the, the VAs I've been to, you can't get in a VA um, without being, you know, pre-screened. And uh, really the guys that are, um, there's just very few people walking around the hallways because everybody's, uh, there's just no visitors. Everybody's in there doing their job and uh, clearly covered up and uh, and really paying attention to this, this pandemic issue that we're dealing with. But the the scanning and uh, going through any of the scans has been been no trouble at all. Sure. Um, I know we're having a problem with Dr. Tan's audio, but uh, somebody asked the question, how they find uh, the latest clinical trials in PSMA therapy? I can tell you where I found ours is clinicaltrials.gov is where, uh, where they're all at. But um, there's also, I, I would recommend that um, uh, our friends at FEN at the uh, Prostate Education Health Network uh, have got a great website and they've, they've coalesced a lot of um, the, the uh, prostate specific clinical trials that are there. Um, you can also go to, uh, to zero.cancer.org and there's a clinical trial site there where we uh, do that. And if you're uh, specific about uh, what's going on in the VA, um, you know, give me a call because I think I probably have, uh, I think I can probably answer or direct you specifically to the doctors that are uh, and the, the facilities that are conducting these trials. And uh, we can go for, there aren't a lot of them. Uh, West LA VA is where it's at. And we're actually uh, on trial there. Uh, we're flying in guys from all over the country to take uh, part in the, um, uh, it's the PYL uh, 
uh, 18F or F18 uh, study that was started by with in con concert with Progenics and is being run by um, Doctors Brangie and uh, Doctors Nichols. Uh, so uh, it's very very easy to get in touch with those guys. Very responsive, and they're looking for uh, you know veteran veteran uh, participants, and it's uh, not limited to any stage at this point. So if you have prostate cancer, you are a veteran. Uh, you're eligible for that to be on that trial, and I highly recommend it. It's a pretty incredible technology. What uh, what everybody is doing. Thanks, Mike. Um, and then this is the question that we Brain we usually Brain get every every year at Patient Education Brain Day. Brain um, how often should somebody be imaged, and what's uh, how often should they follow up? Again, that that is a question that is very case dependent. Um, there's not a set standard of what you're going to do. It depends on what your lab values are doing. It depends on how extensive your disease was at the beginning. It depends on what grade of your disease is. I mean, we use this typical Gleason grading system. Um, and, you know, the more aggressive your disease is, the more often you're going to be wanting to be imaged and followed up to make sure things aren't progressing. There's also variants of neuroendocrine prostate cancer that have kind of its own system thing. So really, it's not something that I think you can say for every individual. It's really getting tied in with a good oncologist um, that's going to be able to understand your exact uh, requirements and to make sure that they're going to be uh, imaging and then treating you appropriately. And, and I think that's really the key is just having a good relationship with your provider to be able to figure out how, how to be going forward. Um, I just and, saw here, we have a little chat from Dr. Tan. He, he said that for uh, for metastatic prostate cancer, it should be followed up every three to four months until it's non-metastatic, and then every six months for if there's a doubling of PSA. I think that's, uh, that's our final question. So, again, I really would like to thank everybody for attending. I also want to thank our sponsors once again, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Estella's Pharma, Blue Earth Diagnostics, ITM, Jubilant Radio Pharma, and Progenics Pharmaceuticals. I'd also like to thank Dr. Sunderland, Dr. Tan, Dr. Parent, and Mike Crosby for all of their valuable input and what they provided today. And thank you for joining us. And again, on August 15th, we'll be addressing neuroendocrine tumors, patient education day, and then on August 22nd, we will be talking about thyroid cancer. And be, on behalf of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging's Patient Advocacy Advisory Board, thank you for joining us today.